Thank you so much. Mm. What an honor to be able to call the creator of the world our Father. What an honor. Well, normally when a preacher would get up here and tell you what to do and how to do it and what not to do and why not to do it, but we began a series of messages several weeks ago on the subject of some things you don't have to do. Isn't that pretty cool? Some things you don't have to do. We talked about you don't have to worry. And here we are entering into the most stressful season of the year, Christmas time. To many, it is very, very stressful. But folks, if we would just think about the song that we just sung, and be reminded that Jesus is the reason for the season, it would really begin to remove a lot of that stress. And then we talked about you don't have to be controlled by sin. When we are born again, we have a spiritual nature, but we don't leave the sinful nature. But we don't have to be controlled by sin. We have been set free, amen? We have been set free. And then last week we talked about, you don't have to be thankful. You don't have to be thankful. But an unthankful person is a very unhappy person. A very miserable person. Well, as we continue this thought today, I want to bring a message on the subject of, you don't have to go to hell. You don't have to go to hell. And I think about the multitudes of people that are watching online all around the world. Maybe somebody just tuned in today for the first time and accidentally found us. You don't have to go to hell. You don't have to go to hell. Each and every day, thousands and thousands of people leave this world to go to their eternal home. And folks, we can make a choice of where our eternal home will be. Some, when they leave here, they go to heaven. And some, when they leave here, they go to hell. But I want you to understand that it's not God's will for anyone to leave this world and go to hell. Those of you that are listening to my voice this morning, you have a choice. Those of you that are listening right now, you have a choice in the matter. And before we conclude this message, I will share with you how that you can secure heaven as your eternal home. This past Thursday was Thanksgiving. And I decided to see if I could find a video of the very first Macy's Thanksgiving Parade. And I found the video that supposedly was the first, I mostly it was just still pictures. 96 years ago, 1924, and the one that was speaking on this video that I found said over two and a half million people was on the streets of New York watching the first Macy's Thanksgiving parade. Now, you say, why did you bring all that up? Because this is what I thought as I was watching those images, and some of them was moving images. Every one of those people, there might be one or two that haven't, but almost every one of them, if not every one of them, have left this world. One at a time. And went into eternity. Some went to heaven. Some went to hell. Every one of us in this service today, and everyone that's watching online, one at a time, we will begin to leave this world. Some maybe next week, some even possibly today, some next month, some this year, next year. But every one of us will one day leave 
this world. I want you to think about that. You are going to leave this world, but you never actually completely die. We live forever somewhere. You have one or two places to go. Either heaven or either hell. And again, I will share with you in a few minutes how you can secure heaven as your home. I want you to understand that Jesus does not want anyone to go to hell. The scripture says in 2 Peter 3, 9, The Lord is not slack concerning His promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to us, but not willing that any should perish. Not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And then in 1 Timothy 2, 4, it says, Who would have all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth? All, he said. And then over in Luke 19, 10, For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which is lost. That's why he came. To seek and to save that which is lost. And then the verse of Scripture that we all are familiar with over in John 3, 16 for God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whoever believes in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Before Jesus ever came into this world, He knew how the world would treat Him. He knew that it would not be very kind to Him, but He came anyway because of His great love for you and His great love for me to give His life so that when we leave this world, we can go to a much better world. Usually when somebody passes away, we say, but they're gone to a better place. Not always. Not always. Unfortunately, many people who leave this, this world do not go to heaven. Matter of fact, over in Isaiah chapter 5 and verse 14, it says, Hell hath enlarged herself and opened her mouth without measure. Think about that scripture for just a moment. Hell hath enlarged herself and she has opened her mouth without measure. What does that mean? I want us to look at that a little bit more tonight. But it means that she's opened her mouth without measure because of the multitudes of people that leave this world unsaved. The scriptures teach that we are an immortal being. The very moment at conception, we become an immortal being. The body does not have a soul. Your soul has a body. Think about that for just a moment. Your soul has a body. We are an immortal being, which means we never cease to be. We will live somewheres forever. One day you'll hear about my death, but the truth of the matter is, it's not really going to be a death. It's going to be a celebration for me because I have already made reservations that when I leave here, I will be able to go into the presence of Jesus Christ. So what I want to do this morning, to begin with, I want us to look in Luke chapter 16, and we've looked at this before, but I want us to focus in on it again today, and I want us to look at two men that lived, one man did well, one man did not do well, and then both of these men died. And then both of them went to another place. I did some research this past week. Did you know that there are actually preachers that will stand in the pulpit and preach today and say that we are not immortal? That makes no sense. And they even bring up scriptures that says that this doesn't really say that we're immortal. In fact, there's a lot of scriptures that says we're immortal. 
that we live forever. I don't know about you, but that brings hope to me. To realize that one day I will die. What, that's what death, we call it death. But I will continue to live. So look with me in Luke chapter 16. We'll begin with verse 19. Follow with me as we look at these together. It says, There was a certain rich man which was clothed in purple and fine linen, and he fared sumptuously every day. In other words, this rich man was doing very well. Every, Every day, the Scripture says, he was doing very well. And then it says in verse 20, there was another man, a certain beggar named Lazarus, which was laid at the rich man's gate full of sores, desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. So, so here we, here's the picture. We have two different men, one rich, one poor, one doing well, one not doing so well. But both are human beings. Both are immortal human beings. Verse 22. It came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom And the rich man also died and was buried. The old beggar doesn't even say the beggar was buried. It just simply says he died. But the rich man, he died, and it says that he was buried. Mo probably had a real fancy funeral, real fancy funeral. But the Scripture says in verse 23, speaking of the rich man, In hell he lift up his eyes, being in torments. Don't sound like to me that death is the end, does it? In hell he lift up his eyes, being in torments. And he see if Abraham are far off, and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried and said, Father Abraham... Have mercy on me and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. But Abraham said in verse 25 to the rich man, he said, Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime receivest the good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things, but now he is comforted, and thou art tormented. Two men lived, both died, both continued to live, one was comforted, one was in torment. It's as if they changed positions. The rich man had everything while he lived, but he lost everything. The poor man had nothing while he lived, but he gained everything. The rich man became a beggar. The poor man no longer was a beggar. Amen? No longer was he a beggar. But the scripture says in verse 25, I am tormented in this flame. Verse 20, verse, that was to verse 24. Look at verse 25. And Abraham said, said, Son, remember that in thy lifetime thou receivest good things. Likewise, it lies with evil things, but now he's comforted and thou art tormented. In verse 26, and beside all this, Between us and you there is a great gulf fixed, so that they which would pass from hence to you cannot, neither can they pass to us that would come from thence. And then he said, Well, I pray thee, therefore, Father, that thou would send him to my 
father's house, for I have five brothers, that he may testify unto them, lest they also come into this place of torment. And Abraham said unto him, They have Moses and the prophets, let them hear them. And he said, Nay, Father Abraham, but if one went unto him from the dead, they would repent. Verse 31, he said unto him, If they will not hear Moses and prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rose from the dead. There are many other verses of Scripture we could look at, but I, folks, I, this is it. It tells us what happens at the very moment of death. To some, it's a great thing. Matter of fact, when you, when you hear about my death, it will be the very best day of my life. The very best. To leave this world of sin, to leave this world of suffering, to leave this world of sickness, to leave this world of disappointments, to go to a place where there is no more suffering, there is no more sin, there is no more health problems, And that's where Jesus wants us to go. Now I want you to jump over to Revelation chapter 20. <clears throat> Revelation chapter 20. Again, we've looked at these verses of Scripture many times before. Let's look at them again and focus in on what happens after this life. So the study of Revelation is a very interesting study. Uh, one of our adult classes is studying Revelation, and it's, it's, to me it's, it's a very interesting study. It talks about what's going to happen later. We realize the next great event to occur in God's prophetic word is the rapture. And that's going to be a great thing. What's going to be cool about that? If the rapture occurred today, those that are saved will just go out together. The dead in Christ will rise first, which means their body will be reunited with their spirit, and then we which are alive will be caught up to be with the Lord, and we'll be changed. We won't have to worry about death. That's going to be pretty cool. But then after the rapture, a terrible thing is going to happen on this planet Earth. After we are gone, the tribulation period will begin. Now, the first part of the tribulation is not too bad. I mean, it's going to be pretty bad because so many people have disappeared. All the babies are gone. The children are gone. Uh, all the saved are gone. So it's going to begin a pretty bad situation. But then the last portion of the tribulation period is going to get real bad. You've got the mark of the beast. You've got the Antichrist coming on the scene. It's going to be pretty bad. But then after the tribulation period, we who are saved will come back with the Lord, and then you have the thousand-year reign of Christ. That's going to be exciting to live and reign on this earth a thousand years in glorified bodies. Man, that's going to be cool. All of us is going to look good then. Wow. But after the thousand-year reign of Christ, some other things are going to happen. And then we come to Revelation chapter 20, and we see when the dead, in Christ, the, the dead who have rejected Christ will give an account for the life that they have lived. Now, what we're about to read is not a judgment to determine salvation. It's a judgment to determine what's going to happen to those that rejected Christ on into eternity. So let's read this, starting with verse 11, Revelation chapter 20. 
John says, I saw a great white throne, and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God. And the books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. So it says, The dead, small and great, shall stand before God. These are all of those thousands, and I suppose millions of people, all the way back to the beginning of time that left this world without wanting to have anything to do with God whatsoever, and they never received Jesus as their Savior. Some of these folks have been in hell for thousands of years, and now they will give an account for the life that they live. See, we all have, because we are a, a created being of God, we will all answer to God for the life that we live. We who are saved will answer to God after the rapture, at the, at the uh, judgment seat of Christ, will be judged for the works that we have done. Works are important, amen? And then the saved will also be judged for their works as well. What kind of life that they live. So then the scripture says there in verse 13, And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. And they was judged, every man according to their works. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever, listen to this, verse 15. This is the key to understanding this passage of Scripture. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. They wasn't cast into the lake of fire because their works was bad. They wasn't cast into the lake of fire because there wasn't a church member. They wasn't cast into the lake of fire because... They wasn't baptized. They was cast into the lake of fire because their name was not written in the book of life. They had never accepted Christ as their Savior. These are some of the saddest verses of Scripture that you will ever read in God's Word. Multitudes and multitudes and multitudes of people no doubt, no doubt that day there will be many screaming and hollering, please search the book again. Maybe my name should be there. You just can't find it. Did we not do many wonderful works in thy name? Please search the book again. There will be probably, church, well, no doubt, there will be church members that will be there that just simply tried to live a good life but never received Christ as their Savior. And then they'll be cast into the lake of fire. Folk, there is life after death. This life is not all there is. In fact, there's one passage of Scripture that says, if in this life only we have hope, miserable we are. Amen. Matthew 25, verse 46, speaking of their eternal home, says this. And these shall go away into everlasting punishments. Notice it says, everlasting punishment. I'm not very smart, but I know what that everlasting means. It means it never does stop. but the righteous into life eternal. Who is the righteous? It's the righteous that have accepted the righteousness of Jesus Christ is the atoning sacrifice for all of their sins. The soul never dies. When that rich man left this world, 
and opened his eyes up in torment, he could still see, he could still hear, he could remember. The only thing he left behind was a sick, tired body that he left behind. And he pleaded for a drop of water to cool his tongue. And I'm assuming that he's still pleading for that even today. So my question to you this morning is simply this. And this is a very serious question. Do you know where you will go when you leave this world? We know one day we're going to leave this world. As I mentioned to you, watching that very first Macy's Thanksgiving parade way back in 1924, two and a half million people watching it from the streets of New York, they're gone. But they still live somewhere. We looked at the scriptures. It talks about life is not the end. Death is not the end. We begin simply a new life. So the question is, do you know where you go when you leave this world? The Bible says today is the day of salvation. In Romans chapter 10, verse 13, it says, And whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. We heard songs this morning about how wonderful the name of Jesus Christ is, and we call him Father. We call him Father because we've accepted Christ as our Savior. Folks, I want you to understand that salvation is not difficult. And Jesus, even right this very moment, no matter where you are, no matter what you're doing, the Holy Spirit can speak to your spirit right now and show you where you are in your relationship with God. First, we are separated from God because of sin. The Bible says we all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Every one of us. It's not your fault that you're a sinner. It's not. We all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. The wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. It's not your fault that you're a sinner. But my friend, if you're able to hear my voice here today, it's your fault if you leave this world as a sinner that have never trusted Jesus as your Savior. It is your fault. Because the scripture says over in I think it's Romans 5, 8, but God demonstrated or commended his love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He gave us a second chance. We don't have to leave this world lost. For whosoever, verse Romans 10, 13, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. It says, whosoever. Folks, the rich man in Luke 16 did not leave this world lost because he was rich. He did not leave this world lost because he wouldn't provide for a beggar. He left this world lost because he never called upon the name of Jesus Christ to save him. 
you're here this morning or listening to my voice, and you understand that you're a sinner separated from God. You're on your way to hell. That is as sure as anything can be sure. That's exactly what's going to happen. But God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. It's not his will that any leave this world lost. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. So I invite you to do that this morning. You say, how do I do that? Just understand that you're a sinner separated from God. Understand that Jesus Christ came to die for you, and you just simply put your trust in what he did, and you say, Lord, please forgive me of my sin. Please save me. And just like that, he will. And then that's when life truly begins, and that's when you really need to begin to serve in him. And that's when you really begin to serve him and to live for him. And then once we become a child of God, our main goal is to help others to become one as well. Amen? We've looked at verse 14 many times. After it says, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Then verse 14 says, how then shall they call on him in in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him in whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without somebody telling them? One of the best things that you can do is to tell others about Jesus. They need to hear it, amen. Amen. They need to hear it from you because many people that you know and many people that you meet will never be in church. Many people that you know and many people that you will meet, we will never meet. To hear the message of Jesus Christ, God may be speaking to your heart to take it to them. What if you did not do that? Can't be saved unless we hear the message. Do we understand that? We can't be saved until we hear the message. Verse 13 says, whosoever, but verse 14 says, all will not. Because we don't take the message to them. Shame on us. To have such a great benefit of salvation and not share it with others. So today's message is simply some things you don't have to do, and one is you don't have to go to hell, but you have no promise for tomorrow. Please, somehow, I just want you to understand that there is no promise of tomorrow. There will be thousands of people that will die today, and they woke up this morning never understanding that this would be the last day of their life. And many, many of you even possibly here and watching online probably think, well, yeah, I understand this, Pastor. I, I do understand this, Preacher. And, and one day I'm going to take care of this. And then you never get around to it. Maybe this rich man thought one day I'll make a change. One day I'll accept Christ. I'll do that one day. But death came before he did. That's why I say today is the day of salvation. When we're able to do something about it. Would you stand with me very quietly? Father, I pray for each one that's listening to my voice. Lord, would you speak to their heart and show them their relationship or a lack of relationship that they have with you? Remind us that death is the door that takes us from time into eternity. Remind us that today is the day 
that we can do something about our lost condition. And Father, I pray for that individual that's listening to my voice that your Holy Spirit is dealing with this very moment. Help them to just simply come to you and say, God, forgive me of my sin. I believe that Jesus Christ came and died for me. Please save me. Please save me. And then we who have been saved, Lord, be, be, remind us again today that we need to do all we can to help others. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. As we sing together. Just as I am without one plea, but that thy blood was shed Just as you are, me, why not today? And that thou bidst me come to thee, Lamb Why not today? Just as I am. Just as I am and waiting not to rid my soul of one dark blood to thee whose blood can cleanse One more verse. One more verse. What if this would be the last invitation that you will ever hear? Just as I have.